crazy. Like he calls him Rain out in the beginning. It's so funny. This necessity forces one to think of quantum field theory in terms of equations of motion. The usual treatment should thus be considered a stopgap without any lasting future. Let's talk about Dirac. So here's the deal. Okay, transitioning into Old Man Reads Old Book. It's 3.15. We have plenty of time. Okay. Um, let me get my... I have a couple notes. So, if you have not been here for one of these, this segment is where I, you know, take some old literature and we talk about the history of the literature, talk about the history of the people involved in the literature, and uh, I may introduce you to a few new physicists you don't, you already, you may or may not know. This story is specific to Paul Dirac, okay? Now, let me give you a little history on Paul Dirac, and uh, and then uh, and then we'll do some reading to kind of, to, to verify what he thought, because we're going to be reading his words. These are both of his books. He wrote two um, books that we'll be looking into, the lectures on quantum field theory, and then also his um, his very, very popular and main book, The Principles of Quantum Mechanics. Okay, so there we'll talk about the dates and everything. Let me tell you a little bit about Paul Dirac, okay? So Paul Dirac was born in August 8th, 1902. He died in October 20th, 1984. He was 82 years old when he passed away. Uh and there's the information I got here mainly is from, uh, you know, the different various sources, but probably one of the most prominent sources that I got this information from about Paul Dirac was um, Graham, uh, I want to get his name right, uh, Graham uh, Farmello wrote a book on Paul Dirac and also gave a brilliant lecture that's uh, available on YouTube. And let me just, so let me tell you a little bit about him uh, right now. So he was born in England in kind of a very modest situation. I think his dad was a school teacher and his mom was a homemaker. So it, he wasn't um, born into riches or, or, or anything like that. His, his parents were, uh, they, I don't think they were poor, but they were certainly in a modest uh, living situation. Uh, he had one older brother and one younger sister, and that's going to come into play a lot. Uh, later on, he was he had very strange parents in the fact that his dad spoke French to him only, and his mom spoke English only. And his dad apparently in his his accounting of the story. Now uh, Graham has some interesting takes on the uh, the accounting because Graham did a lot of research when writing the book, so he spoke to Dirac's uh, Dirac's nieces and nephews, and kind of got the stories from the nieces and nephews about their parents, the siblings. Uh, or at least the sister, because of the uh, uh, unfortunate circumstance that happened with the brother, which we'll talk about too. But um, yeah, apparently, like Drac had some uh, some recollections that his uh, brothers and sister did not share uh, about the the behavior of his of his parents. But he said his father uh, would have separate dinner with him in a separate room and only speak French to him and was very, very, very demanding of his etiquette and things like that. So it's, it's a, a, a weird situation that Dirac describes about his his uh, his upbringing. Um, but and, and despite that, he was a normal student. He had a, you know, an average an average grade. He was good at school. He was very, especially when he started getting into college, uh, he started to become more and more adept into mathematics and physics and very just interested in stuff. But he wasn't one of these um, students who was, you know, at 12, you know, doing a PhD or anything like that. He had a, a relatively normal uh, childhood education, and then he started to excel in when he got into college. He um, he loved relativity. That was one of the big things that pushed him away from engineering because his first degree was in engineering. And then after that, he went into mathematics because he was in love with relativity. He loved symmetries. He, lo he thought that Einstein... So he was born in 1902. So by the time that he was, you know, 1919, he was 17 years old, and Einstein's theories of relativity were really coming into, you know, full, you know, fruition. Like this, Einstein was getting, you know, articles and papers, and like this was after World War One. So, uh, you know, Dirac must have grown up in England, just thinking that Germany was the, you know, the bad guy and everything like that. But here's a German scientist, Einstein, who's coming up and like, pr you know, presenting these beautiful mathematical formalisms. And, you know, Graham uh, Farmelos just explained how much he was in love with Einstein's work. And then, so he went from engineering to a math degree, uh, but eventually he moved into physics at, uh, I think it was, it was Oxford or Cambridge. Let me look at this really quick. So he ended up going to Cambridge to study physics and uh, after his mathematics degree and after his engineering. <laughs> so he had kind of like a weird thing. Apparently he was terrible in the laboratories as well, but I'm not sure. Either way, somewhere along the, the, uh, the road, he fell into disfavor with his brother 
And his brother and him had a very, very uh, heated relationship, so much so that they would not talk to each other, that they would not be near each other, that they wanted nothing to do with each other. And Dirac went to graduate school and did really, really well in his first few years in graduate school, like inc incredibly excelled and was publishing papers and stuff. And then when, uh, in 1925, uh, when Dirac was 23 years old, I think his brother uh, committed suicide. So we got the letter in the mail explaining to him that his brother committed suicide. And he, uh, he just completely stopped producing work. And he ended up going home to grieve. Uh, he, he uh, I guess, um, he didn't ever talk about it, really. Like, he just didn't want to talk about his relationship with his brother. Because they were completely estranged at that point. And uh, he didn't know what his brother was going through or anything like that. And he just got word in the middle of graduate school that his brother took his life. And, uh, yeah, so then, I guess when he was at home, he got a paper from uh, his advisor uh, written by, maybe it was Heisenberg, I don't remember the exact details, but he got a paper about quantum theory, and he was very, very interested in it. And this was kind of like the key thing for Dirac. Like, he started, let's go here, he started going over, um, this was his paper that he published in 1928, February 1st, 1928, where he's he's taking this quantum theory. So now he's back in school. He's had, you know, he's grieved uh, for his lost brother and for what, you know, what happened with that situation. And now he's back. And one of the things that he's thinking about is that this theory of motion, like he always wants everything to be about the equations of motion. That's this thing that I keep finding in his, his text when he writes, is he's very, very um, determined to talk about the equations of motion. And so that, of course, ultimately led to his... Um, his finding of the Dirac equation, uh, where he solves it like for the uh, for a Dirac field, and eventually leads him to to, fall, to work with uh, Fermi Dirac statistics in large quantities and things like that. But it's it's interesting uh, to me that I'm not going to go through the paper. Uh, let me put it in uh, chat though. But yeah, so that was the thing is he got the paper, he got the letter at home of the paper from his advisor and his advisor just wrote on the top of it uh you know what do you think about this what are your thoughts i look forward to hearing from you and then so like his thoughts ended up leading into the Dirac equation and i think that's an amazing thing but here's the thing about the Dirac equation is the Dirac equation explains the <clears throat> uh <laughs> sounds like fancy scotch Dirac. <laughs> um so he had done the Dirac equation, but what happened is when he was trying to think about the motions of the electrons and the photon interaction, he kept getting infinities. Now, Dirac and many physicists and many mathematicians don't like physical infinities. It's not good. <laughs> it's a really bad practice to get, you know, to get comfortable with um, infinities in your physics. And <clears throat> what ended up happening was he, yeah, he was able to introduce another particle, actually a class of particles. Does anybody know what class of particles he introduced to get rid of the infinities? It was a class of particles that have the exact same mass and the opposite spit, or the opposite charge. Oh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> positrons, that's what he, 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 yes, he introduced positrons. He said if there was a particle that had the exact same mass and the opposite charge, then we could talk about, uh, then that would get rid of the infinities. And he wrote it up, and it was the uh, Dirac equation. Antiparticles, yep, the antimatter particles. Uh, <clears throat> that was what he was proposing. Now, because he proposed it, he proposed it, and then in 1928, he proposed you know this Dirac equation. A lot of people met it with like, no, this can't be, blah, blah, blah. You can't like have these particles. They don't exist. They're not, you can't just invent particles. Nowadays, we follow the math, right? Like we have this good, you know, we have these good theories. They, we write down Lagrangians about some random particles. We look through the, the symmetries of them and like, hey, can this particle be real? And then if you look hard enough, you can say, yes, I think this particle can be real. And we go and find it. That's what happened with Higgs. That's what happened with the Eightfold Way, with all of the different uh, baryons and mesons, uh, the hadrons, if you will. And uh, you write down the theories and then you go look for the particles. But Dirac did not 
No, that was not a practice. <laughs> that was just not something you did. You didn't just write down particles and go look for them. So he wrote this down, and then I guess a lot of people poo-pooed it. Well, wow. enter 1932. We get this beauty right here. This is a, an article from uh, the APS uh, where a physicist, experimentalist Carl Anderson, not Phil Anderson, but Carl Anderson, pr provided this uh, cloud chamber. Remember, uh, we built a cloud chamber, and it was a similar thing. Ours was not nearly this effective. <laughs> but back in the old experimental times when they were doing uh, cloud chambers on the regular, notice how this arc here is not very curved, but this one is. And this was ind indicative of the fact that this was a positron. So he published his paper thinking, I, I don't know what this is. This is somehow, you know, it looks like a particle that has the exact same mass as an electron with opposite charge. What could it be? This was 1932, four years after Dirac proposed that the that there exists these antiparticles, a, uh, a positron. <clears throat> string theory is indirectly Dirac's fault. Is <laughs> I don't know. Blame him. <laughs> so this is really cool. So he, he proposed it. This was like the one of the first of his kind where you propose a particle and then you go look for it. He didn't really know what to think of it. And like he just said like, you know, this is a really good theory. Like this is a really good theory. I don't know, you know, what to do about this because it was not practiced. Shortly after this, you go fast forward 25 years later, you got Gelman, you know, predicting eight eightfold part eightfold way with like eight different particles ten different particles you know you got all these different things you got a standard model coming out of nowhere with like the different quarks and stuff and everyone's just you can't even see quarks you can't even see them and yet we all were like oh they got to be there right yeah so that's awesome that this happened now um so he here's the thing is when qed came along you had something very similar happen and we talked about this in the first old man reads old books story where Feynman and Schwinger produced QED and had a lots of infinities, right? And they didn't know what to do with all these infinities. Instead, what ended up happening was uh, Dyson came along and he, you know, they proposed the renormaliz or I don't know if they, if it was the renormalization at the time, if it was known as renormalization at the time, but it was a way to subtract all of the infinities. That was the first week we talked about this. But the, anyways, the point is, is that Dirac heard about that and, and never liked it. <laughs> and I thought it was interesting because he wrote, he gave lectures on the theory of on the lectures on quantum field theory, but he never really grew to like it. Um, and there's some different things that we're going to see about uh, the way that he talked about it. Let's talk about his his viewpoints on uh, quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. So I think I want to do the quantum mechanical book first because that one's the first one he wrote, and then we're going to talk about and then we'll see what he wrote in the other book as well. This is again from. The Principles of Quantum Mechanics by Paul Dirac. This is the preface to the first edition. And it really kind of gets into his um, modes of thinking about nature and quantum mechanics and all of this stuff. Because originally, like I said, he was really infatuated with relativity. He really wanted to study relativity. But instead, he got into this quantum mechanical stuff. He got into this business of antiparticles. And, uh, you know, and then it just followed that that's what he would study mainly. So uh, let's read what he was thinking uh, the preface from the first edition, here we go. The methods of progress in theoretical physics have undergone a vast change during the present century. The classical tradition has been to consider the world to be an association of observable objects, particles, fluids, fields, etc., moving about according to the definite laws of force, so that one could form a mental picture in space and time of the whole scheme. This led to a physics whose aim was to make assumptions about the mechanism and forces connecting these observable objects to account for their behavior in the simplest possible way. It has become increasingly evident in recent times, however, that nature works on a different plan. Her fundamental laws do not govern the world as it appears in our mental picture in any very direct way, but instead they control a, s <clears throat> a substratum of which we cannot form a mental picture without inducing irrelevancies. The formulation of these laws require the use of mathematics of transformations. The important thing in the world, the important things in the world appear as invariants, or more generally, the nearly invariants or quantities with simple transformation properties of these transformations. <clears throat> the things we are immediately aware of are the relations of these nearly invariants 
to a certain frame of reference, usually one chosen so as to introduce spe special simplifying features which are unimportant from the point of view of general theory. The growth of the use of transformation theory as applied first to the relativity and later to quantum theory is the essence of the new method in theoretical physics. This transformation theory is really just uh, like extrapolating physics out of symmetries, right? That's, that's how I think about it. I don't know how you guys like to think about it, but really it's just extrapolating physics out of symmetries, taking the, what transformations are allowable, what symmetries are allowable, and then extrapolating that into what can we do in the real world, like what's real physical transformations that happen. Um, and again, that was his ability to be, or that was his, his one of his f fascinations with relativity is how beautiful it came out of the symmetries. Uh, this state of affairs is very satisfactory from a philosophical point of view as implying an increasing recognition of the part played by the observer in himself, introducing the regularities that appear in his observations and lack of arbitrariness in the ways of nature, but it makes things less easy for the learner of physics. The new theories, if one looks apart from the mathematical setting, are built up from a physical concept which cannot be explained in terms of things previously known to the student, which cannot even be explained adequately in words at all. Like the fundamental concepts, proximity, identity, which everyone must learn on his arrival into the world, the newer concepts of physics must be mastered <clears throat> only by long familiarity with their properties and uses. So there's he's emphasizing that like we we evolved our survival is based on classical mechanics why why would we why would we be able to understand quantum mechanics in a way where we've literally just grown up experiencing classical mechanics so that i don't get hit by a car i don't get eaten by a lion i don't get you know um fall into a a pond <clears throat> Tyrion. From the mathematical side, the approach to the new theories presents no difficulties as the mathematics required. At any rate, that which is required for the development of physics up to the present is not essentially different from what has been current for a considerable time. Mathematics is a tool specifically suited for dealing with abstract concepts of any kind, and there are no limits to its power in this field. That's a big statement right there. Uh, for this reason, a book on the new physics is not purely descriptive of experimental work, must be essentially mathematical. All the same, the mathematics is only a tool and one should learn to hold the physical ideas in one's mind without reference to the mathematical form. In this book, I have tried to keep the physics to the forefront by beginning with an entirely physical chapter and in the later work examining the physical meaning underlying the formalism wherever possible. The amount of theoretical ground one has to cover before being able to solve problems of real practical value is rather large, but the circ this circumstance is an event is an inevitable consequence of the fundamental part played by the transformation theory and is likely to become more pronounced with the th in the theoretical physics of the future. So that's another point of, of what I was saying before about when I talk about the, the physics behind quantum mechanics and the mathematics behind quantum mechanics, I emphasize that it's very important to stress that a particle being in a superposition of states is a mathematical consequence. It's not a physical consequence. This is what Paul Dirac is saying right here. And like this, and when physicists say things like, "Oh, a particle is, you know, is taking every single path in, in uh, path integration," or a particle is, you know, both spin up or spin down at the same time, and like it confuses people, and and language is important, um, and that's what that's what Dirac is saying in this in this paragraph right here. Language is important. You have to be careful not to confuse the mathematics and the physics. While beautiful and leads to physics, it does not always mean that the physical situation is uh, what the math is saying it is. With regard to the mathematical form in which the theory can be presented, an author must decide at the outset between two methods. There is a symbolic method which deals directly with, in an abstract way with the quantities of fundamental importance, the invariance, etc. of the transformations, and there is the method of coordinates or representations which deals with sets of numbers corresponding to these quantities. The second of these has usually been used for the presentation of quantum mechanics. In fact, it has been used practically exclusively with the exception of Weil's book, Group in theory und quantum mechanic. It is known under one or other of the two names wave mechanics or matrix mechanics, according to which physical things receive emphasis in the treatment, the states of the systems or the dynamic variables. It has the advantage that the kind of mathematics required is more familiar to the average student, and also it is the historical method. 
The symbolic method, however, seems to go more deeply into the nature of things. It enables one to express the physical laws in a neat and concise way, and will probably be increasingly used in the future as it becomes better understood and its own special mathematics gets developed. For this reason, I have chose the symbolic method, introducing the representat re representatives later merely as an aid to practical calculation. This has necessitated a complete break from the historical line of development, but this break is an advantage through enabling the approach to the new ideas made as direct as possible. Paul Dirac, May 29th, 1930. So that's a very old reading for us, 1930. That is even before his Dirac equation was proved experimentally. You can describe the system with the mathematics. Yes. <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. Um, but I think this is kind of more of what we look at it nowadays. Um, maybe someone can correct me and say that that's incorrect, but I do think that this is much more what we look at it nowadays and less less with the transformations um, I think the transformations of representatives or representations come a little bit later um, And ultimately they led into what I would think would be the, the quantum field theory um, But like I said, he was not at all enthusiastic of quantum field theory uh, I want this was a much much shorter reading. Um, so I'm gonna read this one. This is this is now 36 years later Okay, so at 19 30 he was 28 years old he had written the Dirac equation but was waiting for it to get discovered uh, I don't know if he knew it was going to get discovered but he was waiting for it to get discovered and uh, and then in 1936 1966 36 years later he definitely moved into much more of a philo philosophical mindset and was very and now uh, this is you know 10 20 years after uh, QED which was like 1949 I think so very interesting uh, his thoughts, he's had a lot of time to think about it, a lot of time to process it, and he and now he's teaching it. Okay, so let's read this. The preface from uh, the Lectures on Quantum Field Theory by Paul Dirac. The treatment of quantum field theory given here is based on Hamiltonian formalism, which is different, very, very different. Um, usually it's Lagrangian uh, formalism, at least nowadays. Um, and the theory is developed as far as possible in a logical manner, with results following from equations of motion. That goes back to that idea that I said that he was very, very, very interested in the equations of motion. He wasn't very interested in like these, um, in other, in other systems. Um, I don't even know what that would mean, other systems. But he was very interested in the equations of motion. This involves a considerable departure from the usual treatment of quantum field theory in which one rather abandons the hope of logical deduction and is content with setting up working rules and showing their consistency, the equations of motion getting lost in the process. I, I, like, you can call out the whole field just like that in the very first paragraph of the preface. Uh, just calls out the entire field. Um... <clears throat> of not being able to represent the equations of motion. Uh, in physics, one should aim at comprehensive scheme for the, descriptive, for the description of the whole of nature. A vast domain in physics can be successfully described in terms of equations of motion. It is necessary that quantum field theory be based on concepts and methods that can be unified with those used in rest of physics. This necessity forces one to think of quantum field theory in terms of equations of motion. The usual treatment should thus be considered a stopgap without any lasting future. <clears throat> uh, I got bad news for Dirac. Um, <clears throat> These lectures were given at Yeshiva University during the academic year of 1963 to 1964. The tape recording of the lectures was transcribed by Daniel uh, Vizkanevki, I think, who uh, to whom I am greatly indebted for uh, giving so much time and care of the work. I have made a number of altercations or alterations, uh, altercations, alterations to the present material in a form of suitable of a form suitable for a book, Paul Dirac, Cambridge, England, August of 1966. Um, crazy. Like he calls him right out in the beginning. It's so funny. This necessity forces one to think of quantum field theory in terms of equations of motion. The usual treatment should thus be considered a stopgap without any lasting future. Wow. He calls them out. I think that's awesome. Uh, and and I I don't know. I've been thinking about it the past 24 hours. And I've been thinking about the way that he, you know, presented that. And the way that Schwinger said the same thing. He said, I don't see how this, ha I don't see how this is going to work. We've done it. We've made it work. But it's like, it's crazy. Because we've done so much good work with QFT. So much good work. But the founders of it were like, we're, doing, we're setting this up, guys. We're set it's working. We don't understand how it's working. And like, at some point... Physicists were just like, yo, it works. 
Stop, stop worrying about it. Okay, we, we're done with the, the founders obviously led us to believe one thing. Now, this is a very important thing to think too. It's a very important thing to think. The founders left us with one thing, and that is that it's okay if we set up a theory and we don't think it's gonna work. It's not about whether we think it's gonna work, it's about whether or not it does work. And quantum field theory does work. Now, does it work perfectly? I don't know, I don't think so. It'd be nice, but like even today, there was an article posted on Archive about the uh, about the X-17 particle. You guys remember that? The fifth force in this, uh, the fifth force that we're dealing with now, right? Uh, <clears throat> was was com was derived using the standard model second second order uh calculations uh of a certain i don't remember what it was but of a certain field of certain interaction or whatever accounted for uh the x17 particle and perhaps i know that it has to be peer reviewed and all that stuff but it's just like it's another one of those things where like if it's true i mean i probably wouldn't be surprised standard model you know comes through again and it's like this thing that we created that the founders of it we're just like, I, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, it works, but I don't know about it. We'll, we'll let the, the later generations deal with it. You know, it's it's so successful. It really makes you wonder, like, if if, if the founders were wrong about it. If it is the way that it, the world works and we have to adjust our, our preconceived notions of how nature is supposed to be. Makes you think.